Welcome. I'm Robert Mealy, the co-director of Quicksilver. We're sorry we can't be with you on BEMP's familiar concert stages, whether it's Emmanuel Church or Jordan Hall, or on the Morgan Library's intimate stage, where we've had so many wonderful concert experiences over the years, and where we've enjoyed meeting so many of you. We're grateful to the Boston Early Music Festival, to the Morgan Library, and to Risa Kern Cultural Productions for giving us the opportunity to create this special event for you tonight. We especially thank Kathy Fay, Lyndon Tubin, and Risa Kern for making this event possible. Thanks to all of you, and enjoy our musical journey through 17th century Europe. I wanted to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about the program we're presenting. This is all the music of the early 17th century, which began in the invention of the Stile Moderno in northern Italy. We'll start with a fantastic sonata by Dario Castello, a composer who, of whom we know almost nothing, only that he worked at San Marco, probably as the head of the wind band there, and that he published two collections of sonatas that are a remarkable level of invention and virtuosity. He says in the preface that these pieces might be good to try over once or twice before you perform them. His Sonata Quarta has some fantastic elements of the new Stile Moderno, including elaborate solos from each violin, as well as dramatic restatives, passionate interjections, and sudden explosive moments. It ends with a fantastic coda of great depth and passion. We follow that with a much more pure and uh, very special voice from Fontana, a colleague of Castello's. Fontana's music is collected in a posthumous publication. We know very little about the composer himself. We know that he was a great violinist, which is spoken of in the preface. The sonata that we'll be playing, Sonata Ottava, actually has some quotations that Castello used in his own music, so we know there was a connection between the two of them. It's a particularly joy for us to play because it's one that has tremendously intimate conversation between the two violins. Of course, violins didn't only do art music as well. We could be used for parties often. And after the Fontana Sonata, we'll hear a wonderful sonata by uh, Andrea Falconieri, a Neapolitan composer. Of course, Naples at that point was part of Spain. Uh, Southern Italy was not actually Italian. And you can hear Spanish influences, I think, especially in the middle section of this sonata, where Falconieri moves into a fantastic Chacona groove which is really wonderful, in fact, particularly since it makes some unexpected modulations in the course of things. We follow this with a true Spanish piece by Murcia, a jacaras, which is a wild dance, song dance, often with text about low lives or crooks or criminals, a kind of narco ballad. And that segues into another piece by Falconieri, a wonderful setting of the folia. Again, you can hear very much that Falconieri is influenced by the Spanish idiom. After this trip to southern Italy, we move across the Alps to the north. We hear from a remarkable composer, Johann Rosenmüller, who actually discovered Italian music thanks to an unexpected journey to Italy. He was arrested on charges of homosexuality in Leipzig and had to flee prison, fled across the Alps, ended up in Venice, where he ended up as a wind player in San Marco, probably played under Monteverdi while he was there. And he also taught at the Pietà, 50 years before Vivaldi did. Rosenmuller, when he arrived in Venice, discovered the world of Italian opera, and I think you can hear in Rosenmuller's sonata the wonderful duetting that turns up in Cavalli and Monteverdi's operas. And this is put into a wonderfully complex counterpoint that is very German. So with Rosenmuller, you have this fantastic combination of Italian lyricism and extremely well-crafted German counterpoint. And it's laced together with these very interesting, very rhetorical adagios that serve as connective tissue between the larger movements. It's also characteristic for Rosenmüller that the sonata ends with a recapitulation of some earlier material. And also characteristic of Rosenmüller, it's suffused with this extraordinary melancholy, which is one of his hallmarks. After the Rosenmüller, we hear from a much more northern composer, probably the most famous composer of our program. This is Diedrich Buchzehude. Uh, mostly known as an organist, of course, today, but many of his pieces were also designed for harpsichord. The prelude in G minor is a wonderful example of the stilus fantasticus, the style of modern music that turned up in Germany, marked by extreme discontinuities and radical shifts of texture. After Buxtehude, 
We return to Vienna, to the court of Vienna. We hear some wonderful party music by Johann Schmelzer, the piece written probably for the entertainment of Leopold I, the Holy Roman Emperor at the time, who was himself a composer. The Polish Bagpipes is a great depiction of folk music from Eastern Europe as heard in Vienna. Its quotations of folk tunes are laced together with elegant contrapuntal moments. It's a great entertainment. It ends with the bagpipes running out of steam in an odd and joking ending. Another Viennese composer was Johann Kaspar Kerl, who had studied with Froberger and also went to Italy to study with Carissimi. So he brought back this great sense of Italian virtuosity, as well as, like Rosenmuller, this characteristic South German melancholy in his music. One of his few surviving trios, the Sonata in F, has some fantastically virtuoso and passionate solos for each violin, which also offer a wonderful opportunity for invention and for ornamentation and for improvisation. A lot of the passages are very slow and invite a lot of decoration on top of them. So what you're hearing is very much improvised and created for this particular moment. After the carol, we hear two more Italian composers. We hear Maurizio Cazzati, one of the great composers from Bologna, who kind of transformed the church scene there. This is his Opus 18. He wrote, I think, 45 opera in all, a remarkably prolific composer. This sonata, La Bentivoglia, is uh, named after a patron in Bologna, and you can hear that it's now starting to shift into the later kind of sonata with separate movements. It pretty much falls into a fast, slow, fast, slow, fast pattern. It ends with a very beautiful, again like the Rosenmuller, a very beautiful ending that kind of trails out into nothingness at the end. We then hear from Giovanni Legrenzi, a fantastic composer who was hoping to get a position at the court of Vienna. In fact, this collection is called La Cetra, after the emblem of the imperial court, the lyre. Unfortunately, this job application did not succeed as he had hoped, and he never ended up working at the court. But his music was greatly appreciated there, and I think you can hear why in this sonata, which again has these fantastic elements of a kind of operatic duet between the two violins at the very beginning, a very, very, very beautiful and haunting piece. We close our program with a very consoling Chacon by Johann Heinrich Erlebach. This is one of only six trios that survive out of Erlebach's enormous compositional output. The rest of his music doesn't survive. It perished in a fire in the early 18th century, so this is one of the few chamber music gems we have from him. And it interestingly shows both Italian virtuosity and a wonderful French sense of dance in the Chacon. We're so glad to be able to come together in this difficult time to be play together, and it's been a great joy to put this program together and to revisit some of our favorite pieces for you all. So we hope you enjoy this program. Thank you.